Okay, I think uh, we'll make a start now. Uh, today I'm going to go on to discuss uh, crystal structures. That means we actually put atoms onto the lattice points and also to begin on point group symmetries. Okay, uh, so as usual, stop me if, uh, if you have any questions. It's better to understand everything during the lecture rather than to face difficulties later. Okay, so here we have a projection of a primitive cubic lattice and we have lattice points at the corners of each cell. And what I'm going to do now is place a motif of a copper and a zinc atom at each of those lattice uh, points with the copper atom being located at 0, 0, 0 and the zinc atom at a half, half, half. So here I've placed a motif of a copper atom at 0, 0, 0 and a zinc atom at a half, 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 the body center. So if I continue doing that with every single lattice point, then I generate the structure of uh, brass, copper, zinc, brass, okay? And in three dimensions, that structure would uh, look like this. But uh, as I said to you yesterday, drawing three-dimensional diagrams will become more and more complicated as the course proceeds. So it's best to look at projections as in the previous slide, okay? So we produce uh, a structure by combining a lattice with a motif. Uh, and in this case, it was a motif consisting of a copper atom at 0, 0, 0 and a zinc atom at a half, half, half. So when I said yesterday that, uh, you know, there are only five kinds of wallpapers, of course, you can buy many, many varieties of those five basic patterns by putting different motifs on each of the lattice points. Okay? So we think there, are, uh, there is a very large number of wallpapers, but in fact there are five basic lattice types in two dimensions and we simply vary the colors, the patterns, etc. Okay, so here's a, a more complicated uh, structure. So this is now a lattice, <coughs> imaginary points, of the face centered cubic uh, type where we have uh, lattice points at the corners of every cube and lattice points at the face centers. So these are at the vertical face centers and this one is at the top and bottom and we don't label the ones which are located at 0 and 1, it's understood. Okay. Uh, so to generate the structure of diamond, we place a carbon atom at 0, 0, 0 and a quarter, quarter, quarter on every one of those lattice points. So here you are. Because in this case uh, we are starting from a height half, the one at uh, the second uh, one in the motif ends up at height three quarters. Okay, is that clear? So we continue doing that. Place the same motif at every single point on the lattice point. So how many carbon atoms are there in the cell? First of all, how many lattice points in the cubic f, four, because uh, the ones at the corners, only one eighth belongs to each cube, therefore that amounts to one lattice point, and the face centers give you uh, half each, and there are six face centers, therefore the total is four. So how many carbon atoms? Eight, because it's simply the number of lattice points multiplied by the number of atoms in the motif. Now, uh, this is obviously a more uh, complicated crystal structure and in three dimensions you can see it's beginning to look uh, messy. Of course the three dimensional diagram is, uh, is nice because you can see the tetrahedral bonding here but if I go back to the previous slide you can still see the tetrahedral bonding because look this one is at zero, these are at a quarter and these two are at a minus quarter so they're pointing downwards and the others are pointing upwards so that's your tetrahedral bonding. So try to use projections to imagine how the atoms are arranged in the cell rather than these complex uh, three-dimensional diagrams. Of course, we have computers and we can plot these very easily and rotate them and so on. So you have uh, this software called Crystal Maker, right? You can access it freely and you can actually do 3D diagrams, but you won't have that in the examinations. So it's best to use uh, two-dimensional projections. And when we do these uh, two-dimensional projections, they are very simple, but it's useful 
to draw four of these lattice, uh, four of these cells next to each other, uh, for for example, like this. And the reason is, it's possible to see symmetry better if you have four of these cells plotted next to each other. So, if I ask you, you know, where is the center of symmetry in this structure? Okay. It would be much easier to find it when we are looking at four cells next to each other. Any ideas where the center of symmetry would be? Sorry. So if it's uh, if it's at a height half in the middle here, um, I'm going from zero to half to one quarter to half to three quarters. So that wouldn't work. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So it'll take some uh, thinking, but it's located at one eight one eight one eight positions. Okay. One eight one eight one eight or equivalent positions in the cell. Uh, and you can imagine that better if you draw four of these cells next to each other. Okay. So it's quite a lot of work, but uh, it makes life a lot easier. Is everyone happy with uh, this so far? Okay, so let's carry on with some more uh, structures. So here uh, is the zinc sulfide structure, where we have a zinc atom at zero 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 and a sulfur atom at a quarter quarter quarter. So this is very much like the diamond structure, except that the two atoms in the motif are now different. Okay. Instead of uh, two carbon atoms, we have a zinc atom at zero 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 and a sulfur atom at a quarter quarter quarter. Uh, this is what it would look like in three dimensions, uh, basically like diamond, except the two atoms are different, different in uh, character and size. And this is the structure of gallium nitride, which again is very similar to the diamond structure, except we have a gallium atom at zero 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 and a nitrogen atom at a quarter, quarter, quarter. Do you know what this is uh, used for? So all of you probably have this. Hmm? Light emitting uh, diodes. Uh, you know, the bicycle lights, the batteries seem to last forever. Uh, that wasn't the case about 20 years ago, where you, know, you would have to buy lots of batteries for your bike lights and still wouldn't be bright enough. Now, they're all made from uh, light emitting diodes, and there's a huge amount of activity in this apartment on gallium uh, based uh, light emitting diodes and how to produce white light and so forth and so on. Have you come across this at all? Uh, did you have a tour of the department or not? Okay, at some stage there will be a tour organized for you, and you'll see the facilities for making gallium nitride and so forth. So, uh, the crystal structure is extremely important in making all these devices and so on. And in fact, the gallium nitride that is used in light emitting diodes is not uh, of a cubic form, but of a hexagonal form. Uh, now, this is a, a yet a more um, complex cell. A complex in the sense that the motif that we place on the cubic F lattice is now three atoms. So there's a, a calcium atom at zero zero zero, and two fluorine atoms. One at uh, this uh, location quarter quarter quarter, and the other one at a quarter quarter three quarter. So it's a motif of three atoms placed at every single lattice point, and that's what it would look like in three dimensions. So even more messy. Everyone happy with uh, creating structures and how elegant this method is because. You know, all you do is you start with one of the 14 Bravais lattices, and if you know what the motif is, it's very, very easy to generate the whole of the structure. Okay, okay um, these are two uh, unit cells. Uh, one of them uh, represents a solid solution. That means uh, we have a mixture, a random mixture, let's say, of aluminum and nickel atoms arranged on a cubic F lattice. All right. So, what is the? Uh, sorry, um, I wanted to ask you what is the lattice type. I've already told you it's cubic F. In this case, all right. We've got uh, atoms located at face centers and at the corners. Uh, but notice that we are making an approximation here. You know. 
there isn't actually any long-range periodicity here because the, we say the atoms are mixed at random, right? So I can't actually predict that, you know, if I start <coughs> from this atom, I'm going to have an if I start from a nickel atom here, I'm going to have a nickel atom here. It could be an aluminum atom. It's a solid solution, right? So there will be consequences of the fact that this is a solid solution rather than a perfect lattice as we discussed in the last lecture. We don't actually have translational, strict translational symmetry. Uh, now, how would this be reflected in the experiments that you do? Uh, not a great deal because the atoms are distributed at random. What it would do is, uh, because the atoms are of different types, you will have local strains, for example, because, you know, they don't match exactly. And therefore, what is the effect of strain on diffraction? Sorry? Bro broadening. Okay. So, you would not get uh, the same um, sharpness of peaks if it was all nickel or all aluminium, but you would get some sort of broadening effect detected. So, we call this cubic F, even though it's a random mixture of two different kinds of atoms, so we don't have strict uh, translational symmetry. Now, supposing that these atoms actually ordered, so we have now the nickel atoms at the face centers and aluminum atoms at the corners. What is the lattice type here? Yeah. yeah primitive. primitive cubic because now we have a motif of an aluminum atom at zero 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 and three nickel atoms at the face centers, okay, located on a primitive cubic lattice. So this is quite different from this in the sense that we now have regained our translational symmetry and the lattice type is now primitive cubic. If you have cubic F, we'll show later on that you don't get two zero zero, uh, you don't get one zero zero reflections when you do uh, X-ray diffraction. So here is my cubic F. And these are at 0 and 1. If I look at the 1, 0, 0 planes, these are the 1, 0, 0 planes, right? Yeah, the faces. I've got atoms in the middle which will diffract exactly half a wavelength out of phase. So when I do diffraction experiments, I don't pick up 1, 0, 0 planes. Okay? But I will pick up 2, 0, 0 planes, half the spacing because there's nothing in between. Uh, when we do uh, structure factors, you'll be able to prove this for any, any kind of plane. But if it becomes primitive cubic, that means, for example, these are now nickel atoms at the face centers and aluminum atoms at the corners, then you will pick up 1, 0, 0 because the atoms located halfway will not exactly cancel out the uh, waves from the atoms located on the faces. So you'll get weak 1, 0, 0 diffraction from that. Okay? Now, do you recognize this structure? It's a very, very important structure. So, uh, what is the chemical formula of this? Ni3Al. Does that ring any bells? Yeah. So, uh, this is what, um, you know, you wouldn't be flying today without these materials. This is uh, classically, this Ni3Al is known as gamma prime and this is your matrix gamma. So, a nickel based superalloy in a turbine blade would typically contain 70 percent precipitates of gamma prime and 30 percent of uh, the matrix. So, a huge amount of precipitation hardening. But notice that these are both cubic, right? And their lattice parameters are not terribly different. And they form with their 1, 0, 0 directions parallel. That means they are cube, cube, cube on cube, right? So the interface is quite coherent. Now, what's the advantage of having a coherent interface if you are operating at high temperatures? Uh, 
it doesn't intend to grow? Yeah, because, you know, if you take uh, a froth of soap and you shake it, you make very small bubbles which will then combine to form big bubbles, yeah? Because that's driven by minimization of surface energy. So the greater the surface energy, the greater will be the coarsening rate. So if you have nice coherency between the precipitate and the matrix, then the coarsening rate at high temperatures is reduced. And you know, these nickel alloys serve in an environment with it as higher than their melting temperature, 1700 degrees centigrade. <coughs> so they are protected. Uh, they remain solid because we have something called thermal barrier coatings on the surface. Of course, uh, what that means also is that uh, dislocations can go easily from the matrix to the precipitate. So, you know, doesn't that say that you don't get much hardening? You know, if dislocations can go through because they are coherent precipitates, then that's not going to give you much hardening, right? Yeah. So, uh, wha what happens is, of course, when a dislocation with a Burgers vector, which is A by 2, 1, 1, 0 here, that's, uh, that's uh, A is the lattice parameter, and this is half 1, 1, 0, that's the typical Burgers vector in uh, face centered cubic metal. But that is not the Burgers vector in this ordered precipitate, because <coughs> this, going from here to here, is not a lattice point, right? you would have to go from here to here to reproduce the crystal structure. In other words, two dislocations, A by 2, 1, 1, 0 dislocations of the gamma would have to penetrate the gamma prime. And that means that you get order hardening. This is a phenomenon known as order hardening. Okay. Everyone happy with that? Okay, now I'm going to move on to uh, symmetry again. And in the last lecture, I mentioned to you some of the symmetry elements. For example, a twofold uh, rotation axis. In this case, you know, this is a, a kind of a recta uh, rectangular parallel pipette, but a rotation of 180 degrees will reproduce that object. So we call that a dyad, a twofold rotation axis. In this case, we have a triad, a threefold rotation axis. That means 120 degree rotation about that axis will reproduce the structure, a 90 degree rotation, and a 60 degree rotation. So these are the basic rotation axis. We don't have a fivefold rotation axis because it's not possible to have a translational symmetry which will have fivefold uh, rotation axes. Yeah, you happy with that? Okay, and uh, in addition to rotation axis, I discussed uh, the mirror plane here and the glide plane where you reflect and then you translate a fraction of the repeat distance. This is the repeat distance, so I reflect and I translate half along, uh, along that direction parallel to the mirror plane and that's called a glide plane and a screw diode means a rotation plus a translation at the same time. So today I'm going to neglect uh, these two, which include translations, because these translations are quite small, yeah, a fraction of a repeat distance. Uh, and when we look at things like the macroscopic properties, uh, the macroscopic shape of a crystal, uh, equilibrium shape of a crystal, you don't pick up these translations. And what I'm going to examine is all the symmetry elements passing through a point in an object. Okay. And obviously, if it's passing through a point, then there are no translations. Okay. So, just to give you an example of how useful this can be, I'm going to uh, go a little bit into chemistry. But as the course progresses, you'll see the use of point groups and, and so on much more. Okay, so here is a molecule of water, H2O, and you know it's, it's bent, right? And in the last lecture, I explained to you that we wouldn't have civilization if we didn't have magnetism in iron. We also wouldn't have civilization if this molecule was straight, because then the density of ice 
would be greater than that of water and the oceans would be frozen yeah, because the ice would be at the bottom and there's no heat source and therefore the whole of the ocean would freeze. Okay? So this is another story you can tell your friends that we owe life to the fact that the molecule is actually bent. <coughs> now if I look at the symmetry elements passing through that molecule, you can see obviously that there is a, a two-fold rotation axis here. If I rotate by 180 degrees, I recover that molecule, right? And that there is a mirror plane parallel to that axis. So we say that the symmetry elements <coughs> passing through this point are 2M. That means a dyad with a mirror plane parallel to that dyad. Okay? If that mirror plane was perpendicular to the dyad, we would write it as 2 upon M. Okay? So 2M means that the mirror plane is parallel to the dyad and 2 upon M means that the mirror plane is normal to the dyad. So this is now my mirror plane and this is the dyad. Okay, everyone happy with that? Those are all the symmetry elements passing through that point in the um, oxygen atom. Now why is this important? Okay, well, if we look at the vibration modes of the molecule, uh, there are three different modes illustrated here. Uh, here we are stretching in all directions. In this case, we are stretching and pushing, and this is a, a sort of a bending motion of the molecule. So each of these vibration modes will give you lines in your uh, spectroscopy. Now, if another molecule has the same point group symmetry, then you must pick up similar lines in your spectroscopy. Okay? And uh, here you are. So, water and sulfur tetrafluoride have the same point group symmetry. Okay? So, this is sulfur tetrafluoride. Can you see that there's a dyad and a mirror plane parallel to the dyad? So, uh, the dyad would be passing, passing vertically up here and the mirror plane would contain all three of these. Yeah. So, it's the same point group symmetry. Now, because there, is, there are more atoms here, there would be more vibration modes as well. But the three basic vibration modes that I illustrated for water would be picked up in the spectrum. Okay. So, point group symmetry is important uh, in... Uh, um, chemistry and in I will show you in crystallography as well. So is everyone happy so far? Okay. Right, so this is now a crystal of gypsum, uh, calcium sulfate and the shape of the crystal looks like this. Um, I'm going to play a movie to show you the three-dimensional shape of this crystal and then ask you whether you know what the point group symmetry of this shape is, all right? So, um, let me just, whoops, sorry, go back, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here, here's the shape, and you can see that the top faces are not the same as the faces that we started off on the side, okay? So the axis uh, that's going normal to the zero, one, zero plane will be what? <coughs> what kind of a rotation axis will it be? Um, dyad, because look, uh, these faces here are not the same as these faces, right? So the axis going through there is going to be a dyad. And is there any other symmetry element? Mirror plane, which is uh, going along here, right? So what would I label this as the point group symmetry? 2 upon m, all right? So now go to your table 1.2 in your notes. Like what? Uh, no, no, but you don't know what the angles are, yeah? Uh, the angles between this and this. Yeah, but wouldn't it be the same as the angles on that space? Yeah. Th think about it, okay? Um, and look at the movie as well. And you'll see that the symmetry elements are 2 upon m. Uh, can you go to your table 1.2? 
what what do you think what crystal system do, would this belong to just just from the shape yeah yeah so just by looking at the shape uh, you can determine which crystal class this belongs to okay so that's quite a powerful thing if you have the equilibrium shape of the crystal you can work out which crystal class it belongs to so um, just to answer your question if I if I draw that the 111 planes and 011 that won't be a mirror plane Okay, uh, so just by looking at the equilibrium shape of the crystal, you can determine which crystal class it comes to. And if you go to the website that's listed on your, on your notes, page one, you can see thousands of pictures of beautiful crystals in equilibrium shapes, which I took in, uh, uh, in Moscow and in Colorado where you can see the shapes of the crystals and determine what crystal class they belong to just by looking at the shapes because these minerals have evolved over many uh, over a very long period of time so they are very nicely faceted okay okay now um, we go to apsomite uh, and if you look in your notes I explained that the angle between this and this is not 90 degrees all right so, if I show you the movie, so this is the uh, shape of crystallite, uh, and I'm rotating it about an axis that is normal to this edge over here. Okay. And what I want to show you is that by doing that rotation normal to that edge, I've basically recovered exactly the same shape. Yeah? So this green was on top, green is at the bottom now, so we've done a 180 degree rotation, but these two are identical. Okay? So there's a two-fold rotation axis passing through that edge. Okay? And a two-fold rotation axis passing here, and through the other edge. So, what would be the point group symmetry? Two, two, two. Yeah. So there are there are three dyads. Uh, and what sort of an object would have three dyads at ninety degrees to each other? So, without looking at your table, what sort of an object would have three dyads? So a diode means, you know, the face is effectively a rectangle. Tetragonal, uh, tetragonal would also have a fourfold axis. So you are on the right track. Reduce the symmetry. Orthorhombic. orthorhombic <coughs> yeah. So if you look in your table, two to two belongs to the orthorhombic crystal class. Okay. Yeah. So do do you see that the point group is uh, useful? in very quickly determining what sort of a shape, uh, what sort of a crystal class the material belongs to. Okay? Now, of course, you can do many other experiments to prove that and to look at how the atoms are arranged and to look at the density to see how many atoms there are in the unit cell and so forth. But just looking at the shape, as long as it's the equilibrium shape, uh, you can work things out. This also applies to some extent to precipitates that form in the matrix. Uh, as long as their shape, again, is determined by interface energy minimization, we can use symmetries to see what kind of a precipitate that would be. OK. Uh, now, there is, a, there is a, some notation that I need to teach you. And for that, you have this table in your notes. Is that table 1.2 again? Yeah. And uh, in this table, the different crystal classes are divided 
into two parts. One part has only low order rotation axes, so we don't have any triads, tetrads or hexads in the orthorhombic, monoclinic and triclinic systems and the four at the top have higher order rotation axes. So the notation that's used for the point group symmetries for these two classes is slightly different. <coughs> and remember that uh, you know notation is notation and you, you're not expected to memorize notation, right? But you need to understand when people use these terms what it means. Um, so I'm going to briefly go through the notation and there are 32 of these point groups and they are also subdivided into point groups which are centrosymmetric and non-centrosymmetric. So uh, if you have uh, a tetragonal crystal with a point group point uh, group 422 then it's not centrosymmetric and it might exhibit properties like piezoelectricity, ferroelectricity, electricity etc. But if it's centrosymmetric uh, for example 4 upon mmm then you will not uh, find those properties. Okay, so the notation is actually very simple, uh, but you need to remember that it's slightly different for the low order rotation axis and the high order rotation axis. Okay, okay so I'm going to go um, slowly. So this is uh, the case representing low order rotation axis, so we are dealing with triclinic, monoclinic and the orthorhombic system and I've drawn here a shape uh, which is an orthorhombic um, shape, okay, so it's an arbitrary shape that I've drawn which has orthorhombic <coughs> symmetry and the way that you would write the point group symbol is you basically find the symmetry elements which are parallel to x, y and z axes simple as that, okay. So in this case I have a twofold axis parallel to the x-axis here and then I have mirror planes here along z and y. So the point group symbol is 2mm. Yeah, everyone happy with that? Now in writing these point group symbols you may well find other symmetry elements Right. But just having 2 mm will automatically generate those additional symmetry elements. Right. So we will do this uh, in a little bit more detail in the next lecture. But you don't need more than three symbols to define the point group symmetry if you follow these conventions. Okay? Okay, so if I go back to this table, um, you know, in this case, in the monoclinic system, there is only one dyad, so we don't have three symbols in the point group symbol, uh, point group notation. We just have one symbol because all we have is a dyad, or a mirror plane, or a dyad with a mirror plane normal to it. What do you think uh, the symbol bar one means? Yeah, so it's a it's a rotation of a rotation and then an inversion <coughs> through the center. Okay? So it's a combined rotation <coughs> and then inversion through the center of the body. So if you don't have three symmetry elements in the point group, that doesn't matter. You know, it simply says that you are working with a very low symmetry crystal. Okay? Right, now when we deal with systems uh, with, uh, sorry, this, uh, this is not right, when it says without order axes, what I meant was with high order axes, okay? Uh, so this is now representing the cubic, uh, tetragonal, uh, and uh, trigonal and hexagonal systems where we have, you know, threefold axes, fourfold axes, and sixfold axes. Now, in this case, uh, we always put the high order axis uh, as the first symbol parallel to the z axis. So the fourfold axis is the first symbol. And then uh, we have the mirror plane here, 
uh, normal to the x-axis. But notice that if I have a fourfold axis and a mirror plane normal to the x-axis, then I've got to generate another mirror plane here automatically, right? This one. Okay? Because we've got a fourfold axis, therefore this mirror plane would become that if I rotate by 90 degrees, right? And indeed, you will have additional mirror planes here automatically generated by these operations. Okay? So, the symbolism is straightforward that we put the high order axis parallel to Z, that's the first symbol, and then we have the two mirror planes uh, normal to X and Y. Okay? But you will generate additional symmetry elements which you don't need to include in your point group notation. Okay? Just having the 4mm generates everything in the entire symmetry set. So, in the next lecture when we do stereographic projections, you'll see that if I use 4mm, then I will not just have a four-fold axis and two sets of mirror planes, but I'll generate additional mirror planes and dyads and so forth. Okay? So, just three symbols is sufficient to deal with this. Now, there is uh, one, one uh, problem uh, with the cubic system, and that is that the defining symmetry of a cube is that you must have four triads. Okay? So, we break the convention and the middle symbol will always be a triad in the case of a cubic system. Right? It's not parallel to the x-axis, it's not parallel to the y-axis and z-axis, but it is so important because it's a defining symmetry that the middle symbol will be a triad here. You can see that three threefold axis is not parallel to x, y, or z, but nevertheless we have it whenever we have a cubic system. <coughs> okay? So it's not that complicated, but these are conventions and you just have to understand them. Right? It's, it's not a memory exercise either. Are you happy with, with this? Okay, so, so far we've learned that we can use point group symmetries uh, to, for example, look at the shapes of crystals and deduce which crystal class they belong to. Um, we can use them to determine, you know, the sort of lines we expect in spectroscopy and <coughs> there will be many other examples that we deal with uh, as the course progresses. And there are 32 of these point groups for the seven crystal classes and translations are not included because just by looking at the macroscopic shape of a crystal you can't uh, observe the minute translations associated with glide and um, screw rotations. Okay, so um, that deals with the elements of symmetry. Um, I just want to remind you now of the Weiss zone rule. Right? The Weiss zone rule says that if I have a direction uh, UVW and if it lies in the plane with Miller indices HKL then UH plus VK plus WL will be zero. Okay? Now which crystal system does this apply to? All of them. Uh, yeah, yeah, it does apply to cubic, but it actually is completely general, all right? And uh, I think that maybe at part 1a you've done a proof of this, which is uh, quite a long-winded geometrical proof. When we do the reciprocal lattice, you'll be able to do this in 30 seconds, okay? And prove conclusively that it applies to any crystal system at all, right? <coughs> so you can use this Weiss zone rule to find uh, direction which lies in a plane uh, for any crystal system, whether it's uh, triclinic or cubic. Are you familiar with the term zone axis? Yeah. So a zone axis basically is a direction uh, which has lots of planes parallel to it. Yeah. So here you can see um, all these planes share this common common direction, and the normals to these planes will all lie at 90 degrees to the zone axis. Okay? Now, in the cubic system, 
uh, a direction with uh, Miller indices 1, 1, 0 will be exactly parallel to the normal to the plane 1, 1, 0. Okay? So, you can label that either as a direction or as a plane normal. 1, 1, 0 direction is actually at 90 degrees to the 1, 1, 0 plane. You have to be careful that when we deviate from the cubic system, that is not necessarily true. So, here for example, is a, a tetragonal system and you can clearly see that the 1, 1, 0 direction here is not normal to the 1, 1, 0 plane. Okay? So, when we go away from the cubic system, be careful that you know, working out where the plane normal is, is not straightforward. Okay? So, there are some uh, examples in your question sheets where we will be dealing with non-cubic systems and you have to think about the geometry to work out the angles. Okay? Okay, I think that is all for today because we have dealt with some difficult concepts and we will start with stereographic projections in the next lecture.